Hi there, I'm Danielle Navarro and I will be talking about doing more with data, an introduction to Arrow for R users. Before I get into uh, all the low level details, uh, I'll just quickly say a little bit about myself. I'm a developer advocate at Voltron Data. I'm a data scientist, a recovering academic and a, a generative artist. Um, and I tweet a lot at uh, DJ Navarro. And that's enough about me. Let's talk about Apache Arrow. As people at this conference will probably be aware, Apache Arrow is a multi-language toolbox for accelerated data interchange and in-memory processing. And I say that a little bit like a haiku for a reason. There are three different points that I try to communicate to new users. Firstly, that it's a multi-language toolbox. It's something for people to use in different programming languages. It's there to help us communicate data cleanly between data and programming languages across different platforms and so on. And it's also an engine to let us do analytics in memory. Okay. So when explaining this to new users, I try to highlight uh, the importance of thinking about data serialization. Typically we have data sets which are stored somewhere on disk that might be in Parquet format, in CSV, it doesn't really matter. It's in some format and it needs to be loaded into memory in whatever programming language you're using, R, Python, C++. And if you've got applications written in different languages, they need to exchange data from one to the other. Every single time you do this, you incur a copy and convert cost. You have to serialize and transfer the data. Those serialization costs add up. They can be up to 90% of your computation time, and that's painful. Minimizing that by having some degree of standardization, of agreeing that we could represent the data in a common format, in memory allocated in a single place, which we'll call Apache Arrow, would be a good idea. That way, when R and Python, for instance, exchange data, all they have to do is pass pointers around. No mucking about with sending massive data sets across to each other. That sounds like a great idea. The second thing is that if we're going to agree on a kind of standard, we should have it be a good standard. And an important part of having a good standard is agreeing to use columnar uh, format. Um, if you have data organized in tabular structure, rows and columns are not created equal. The data that goes into a column, because they're a variable, tend to be similar to each other. So 1969 is similar to 1966, is similar to 1959. You can do the same kind of operations on those things. In contrast, Stonewall in 1969 New York are not the same as each other. You can't do the same operations with them. So if you have your data stored row-wise in memory, adjacent objects in memory tend to be different to each other. You cannot send the same instruction to handle multiple adjacent parts of memory. If you organize things column-wise in memory, you can. And on modern processors, that makes a big difference because you can do this thing that like all of these smart hardware people tell me is great, uh, called single instruction multiple data. You can vectorize your operations at the CPU level. A bunch of different uh, objects in memory can be handled with a single instruction and that speeds things up. That's cool. So when I tell people that they go, yeah, yeah, that's very nice, Danielle, but, but how does all this stuff fit together? That's very abstract and fair enough. So let's talk a little bit about R and Arrow and how they relate to each other. So I'll start by talking about Arrow and how R fits into the Arrow picture of the world. So as we think of things in the Arrow worlds, we have this pro project specification that says, hey, this is how a data structure should be organized in memory. This is how a data structure should be communicated from one uh, process to another. We have different languages that each independently implement these, uh, these standards. So the C++, JavaScript and Rust implementations are all independent of each other. They are distinct implementations of the same standard. In contrast, in R, Python, Ruby and MATLAB, and um, 
we don't implement the standards directly. Rather, we have bindings to the C++ library. So the way that R fits into the Arrow world is by having uh, these bindings uh, to the C++ library that implements the Arrow standards. OK, cool. How does this work? How does this play out for an R user? An R user it, at this point is going, that's nice, but I want to manipulate data. I just want to do data analysis. Fair point. So here's how Arrow uh, makes that easier. First off, the Arrow package allows you to analyze, process, and write multi-file parquet files. Uh, it can write C CSVs. You can write things to uh, and from S3 buckets and so on. Most of that, but not all of that functionality exists elsewhere in R, but this is a really powerful thing in itself. For most R users, however, the, the big selling point is that you can do this with larger than memory data sets. That is, your, if you've got a data set, and we'll see one shortly, which is just too big to fit in your memory, you can still analyze it, which in R traditionally you can't do because R likes to load things into memory. Um, and yeah, that's a problem normally. It has a whole bunch of other things it can do, but the one that I think most R users get excited about is that it supplies a dplyr backend. You can analyze Arrow data using very familiar dplyr language. And I'm going to unpack that slightly because it's kind of important. The dplyr package that a lot of us use for our data manipulations has two distinct functions. It provides a user-facing API that gives you this grammar of data manipulation. And it also supplies a computational backend engine that does all that manipulation uh, for you. And these two things are kept separate from each other in such a way that it's quite possible for other packages to come in and supply backends that work on different data structures. So quite famously, dbplyr exists to do the same thing that dplyr does, um, but for database tables. So when your underlying data is stored in an R table, like on R uh, data frame or tibble, then the regular dplyr uh, engine will do the work for you. If it's stored in an SQL database, on the other hand, you can use dbplyr and you can still use the same dplyr API to do the work. Arrow does the same thing. If your data structures, if all your data are being stored, using the Arrow C++ library, then the Arrow R package will supply the bindings that allow you to uh, write regular dplyr code that will then be evaluated in Arrow and not in R. So it means that you get to write normal dplyr code and not have to think too much about uh, what's going on under the hood which is pretty cool when you start looking at what that actually means in practice. Here is a toy example that, uh, you know, I say a toy example, but I'm going to analyze 1.7 billion rows of data here. And this is something I actually have to do for a workshop I'm teaching very soon. So uh, here is, here's me uh, playing around with some data. Um, before I can do that, of course, I would need the package. I have that locally, but if you didn't, all you would have to do is follow the usual procedure and just type install.packages arrow. Um, make sure that you have both the arrow uh, package and dplyr loaded. You need both of them in order to have the dplyr backend uh, working. And then you're good to go. If that doesn't work, uh, I've got some links here uh, for new users. You can go and uh, check, uh, check these out and help troubleshoot any errors that you might run into. Hopefully that all goes very smoothly. And if it has, then you go, OK, cool. Please give me almost 2 billion rows of data. Um, and I'm going to uh, do that using the New York Taxi Cab data set, which is relatively famous. Um, the original data set is supplied by New York City Taxi and Limousine Service, um, and it's basically got pickup and drop-off locations, the times that these uh, um, trips took place, the fees charged, tips, etc., for essentially every taxi ride from 2009-2022. So what I'm going to do is try and extract from 
from this 1.7 billion uh, trips, those trips that were pick pickups from one of the three major airports in New York City, that's JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark. And what I want to do is look at where those airport pickup rides ended up. So I want to look at where were the destinations of those trips. So let's go and do it. Step one, I need to download the data. Conceptually, this is straightforward. All I have to do is go copy files. That's a function supplied by the Arrow package from an S3 bucket, uh, which is like the Amazon uh, simple storage service. Um, here is the uh, the name of the S3 bucket that uh, we have that um, has all this data in the format that I'm going to use it. And then I just say copy it from there to a location on my laptop, uh, which will be datasets slash NYC taxi. Straightforward, but long because you've got 69 gigabytes worth of data. So, you know, don't expect that to terminate quickly. For me, that was an overnight job because my internet connection is terrible. You may have more luck than I did. Okay, once you have all the data, um, we should have a look at what it is. It's not one 69 gigabyte file. That would be a disaster. Um, what it in fact is, is 158 separate uh, Parquet files. Um, and what it does is split up this one table separately so that there's one month of data in each file. So we have it partitioned by year and by month. So I'm using the directory function from the FS package uh, to have a quick look at what this directory structure looks like. And you can see it here. Let me just, um, why is it not showing me the whole thing? Okay, it doesn't really matter. It's got, it breaks things up into, ah, there's what I'm looking for, my scroll bar, aha. So yes, year equals 2019, month equals one, and then there's a parquet zero, uh, there's a part zero dot parquet file in there. Um, so that's the directory structure we're working with. Okay. We then go to open it and we're going to use the open data set function. And not surprisingly, this does not load all of that data into memory. What it does instead is scan those 158 files and construct an, uh, a summary of it. And so the output here says we have a file system data set that's been constructed from these 158 files. But it does list off a bunch of metadata, like it tells you um, what are the names of the variables. So here's the pickup uh, date time, that's uh, a timestamp variable, the number of passengers, that's an integer, how far it was, that's a double, and so on. Okay, so in some sense, we've indexed that data set, though we have not loaded the whole thing in memory. However, the Arrow package knows how to operate on this thing, which is convenient. Just to check, do we really have a hundred, have 1.7 billion rows? So I can take that data set and pipe it to the nrow function. And yes, um, it does tell me there's 1.7 billion rows of data. Um, have I somehow managed to defeat the laws of physics and the size of my uh, laptop memory and loaded this into R? I absolutely have not. So if I use the object, size function from the lobster package, you can see it's only about you know, 260 kilobytes in size. Like I've loaded some metadata, not the whole thing. Cool. Is there a trick? Of course there's a trick. Like the trick here is just you read the files, you read data as you need it. You don't try and store the whole thing in, in memory. Okay. Let's go on and look at how this plays out when I try to analyze things. Initially, I want to just start just making sense of my data. So I want to use my usual uh, dplyr commands. Let's just, for the sake of my sanity, I want to filter it so that I've only got cases, the taxi rides that took place in 2019. And I'm going to only keep those variables where the name either matches pickup or drop off. So what happens? I get this. So it says that I've returned a file system data set query. So this hasn't evaluated yet. Um, but what it's saying is that I'm going to get something that includes these variables. Like here's a list of the variables that I've got. Um, and it tells you what filter I'm going to apply. This doesn't actually evaluate until I tell it to do so explicitly. 
So it's an unevaluated query. And before I go to evaluate it, it's always worth thinking about whether I really want to. Um, and the reason to think about, to, to mention this is that sometimes you might be trying to uh, pull a huge amount of data into R that you don't want to. So the thing to keep in mind here is that there's two distinct ways of evaluating the query. Compute will uh, evaluate the query in arrow, so all the data will stay in arrow. Calling collect will evaluate it and return the results to R. So you can see here in this particular case, when I had this query that I had just constructed, that's going, if I count the number of rows, that's going to return 84 million rows of data into R, which R can handle, but I don't particularly want it. So if I modify my query slightly and just say, hey, just, just give me the first few rows. This is a query that can be evaluated extremely efficiently, um, doesn't cause me any problems, and here's what I get. The key thing that I notice is that first off, uh, I've got a pickup location ID, which is an integer, and that tell, gives me a numeric code for a location. What I don't have is longitude and latitude data. Like that's not a reliable variable for my purposes. So what I'm going to do is code the drop-off location. Like there's a drop-off one just there I haven't referred to. Um, but I, I want, I'm going to code the drop-off location using these location ID variables. Okay, that's what I found in my first exploration through the data. Cool. Which locations? Currently, all I have are these numeric IDs. Those don't solve my problem. I need to know which of those numeric IDs correspond to the airports. Okay, luckily for me, uh, there is some auxiliary files that get supplied along with source data. One of those is a CSV file uh, called taxizonelookup.csv, which has all of this extra information about those, those taxi zones. It's a small table. It means I can handle it natively in R without you know, any complications. So I'll read the CSV, I'll clean up the names, um, and then I get this as my result. So you can see I've got a small table here with 265 rows. So there's one row per taxi zone, and I've got its numeric ID. So that's it there. It tells what, uh, what borough um, it belongs to in New York. Uh, EWR, I guess, isn't a borough, but Queens and Bronx and Manhattan are. Um, it gives you the name of the zone and so on. And that's the key thing, right? If I take this table and filter it down further by those zones whose name includes the word airport, I get what I'm looking for. I've got Newark, JFK, LaGuardia, and those correspond to locations 1, 132, and 138. So I'll just uh, store those in a little vector, um, and then I will be able to uh, filter my data set in the way that I want to um, and do the kind of operation that I need to for this little task I'm trying to solve. Excellent. Let's go do that. Okay, so here's what we've got. First off, let's find the airport pickups. For that, we can again filter uh, and select. So the first off we filter. So we're just gonna say, find me all those taxi rides where the pickup location ID belongs to one of those three airport zones. Then what I'm gonna do is just select those variables I care about. And I could use the same select statement I used last time, uh, but um, I'm trying to prune down the number of variables I return, so I'm finding that Something that matches either date, time, or location ID will be sufficient for my purposes. So that's what I'm going to do. Excellent. So here's what I've got. Here's my query, which uh, says, "Yep, these give me these ver sorry, these zones uh, for my filtering, and give me these variables." That's uh, exactly what I need for uh, my purposes. Oh. What I would also like to do, however, is to have the zones uh, associated with their proper names. Like that numeric ID is not great. To fix that, I'm going to apply a database join. Like what I really want to do is do a left join between 
my New York City data, uh, taxi data, that's the big one with, which originally has 1.7 billion rows with New York City taxi zones, which has 260 uh, something rows. So here's my join statement here, which is using the normal dplyr syntax. Under the hood, when this goes to evaluate, of course, Arrow is going to be doing the work, not dplyr, but um, we get to write normal dplyr code. Yay! So what we're doing is we're going to say the variable uh, drop-off location ID in the left in the New York City taxi uh, data set should be uh, uh, joined, should be used to join is the key on which we join with uh, the location ID column in um, New York City taxi zones. Okay, cool. So that's how we, that's what those are the variables we're going to join on, and this should then for every single row in my resulting data set, I should actually have the name of the the drop off uh, zone, which seems handy. All right, so this looks good. Looks like we've got a query that's structured the right way. We've got um, the the variables from the original data set, but we've also got, it's also going to include borough, zone, and service zone as these additional variables that have been added from NYC taxi zones. Cool, we're ready to go. Let's go collect this. And it does exactly not what I was expecting. Oh dear, it throws an error. Um, this is something an R user doesn't expect to happen at this point in time, and I deliberately rigged it so that it would throw an error. Part of the problem here is that although the location ID variable in New York City taxi zones and the drop-off location ID variable in NYC taxi are both integers, they are not the same type of integer. So one of them is 32-bit, the other one is 64-bit. Our users are often not expecting that kind of thing to happen. So I wanted to throw an example, show an example here of where you have to explicitly control the type of uh, variable that is being created here. So this is how you solve it. Uh, in Arrow, you use schemas. Um, the problem here essentially is that data types in R and Arrow are not identical. You have this set of defaults in the arrow package, which will help you uh, move them across and they're good, but they're not perfect. So we use schemas to be really explicit about what we want to do. So what we're going to do is say, okay, the drop off locations here, we want this to be, it is going to be integer 64. And we're going to use the schema function from the arrow package to make sure that that happens. Um, so here's how I change, this is how I uh, manipulate my that auxiliary table so that I get it in the right format. First, I'm just going to, this transmute statement isn't super interesting. All I'm doing is, this is actually just renaming some variables. Um, here's the important part is when I, I'm going to convert it to an arrow table and I'm going to apply the schema that I just wrote down, which means that when this thing gets created, it's going to have the variables I care about Right, so the drop-off location ID, um, which now has the same name as it as it did in the original data set. Yay, I can simplify my join statement down the track. But the important thing is that it's now integer 64. So when I go and do this, my left join statement is now nice and simple. I'm just, just left joining NYC Taxi on NYC Taxi Zones 2. I collect that and it works really, really nicely except for the bit where my scroll is not showing very good. There we go. There's 22 million uh, rows in that, uh, which is a little big for my liking, but we can take that um, and we can do things with it. Better yet, before we actually decide to collect it, what we could do is summarize it in Arrow. And Arrow has a whole lot of uh, functionality that lets us do that. So very quickly, here's how we do that. Here's the query that I just wrote. It looks like this. This is exactly the same code. And now what I do is I will use, again, this is standard dplyr syntax. I'm going to count uh, the results. Um, I'm just going to count the number of rows uh, for each uh, drop-off zone, and I'm going to arrange it in uh, descending order of um, frequency. And then I'm going to collect. 
and that has the nice result that only 262 rows come back into R, which is nice and small and simple. We can see that the most common uh, destination is the times is Times Square, the theater district. It's not super surprising. You can see that, you know, essentially um, Midtown Manhattan is where people mostly go, but there's a lot of things where you end up at other airports. So airport transfers are actually some of the most common taxi uh, rides that you uh, get from New York City airports. Okay, so I do a bunch of additional work which has nothing to do with Arrow, but everything to do with the data visualization. And finally, I get my pretty picture, right? Which is the sort of thing that I might want to show to people. So, so where, if you're picked up at an airport, where do you end up? Probably at Times Square or at JFK is essentially where you're going to end up. Um, but there's a nice pretty picture and you can wave that around and say, hey, cool, I'm happy. And that's basically it. That's all I wanted to say um, in this talk. Um, I've got some links here to, if you if you want to uh, go follow up on this, we've got links to the documentation, there's a cookbook, there's even uh, a list on GitHub of a bunch of informal resources that you can uh, check out to learn more about how to use the Arrow package in R. The Arrow community, we're here to help. We're going to be working on improving our documentation. We're going to put together more novice-friendly tutorials and just be visible and helpful where we can. So I'm going to leave it there and just say, hey, Making connections with, our, with data is great. I really like Apache Arrow. I like wrangling data with R. And that's one of the reasons I like the Arrow package is because I get to pull all these things together.